Today on Super Soul Sunday. Love and blessings. Love and blessings back. Dean Ornish is a world-renowned doctor, best-selling author, researcher, and professor. His patient list includes President Bill Clinton, Senator Cory Booker, and country legend Garth Brooks. The more you change, the more you improve at any age. For more than 40 years, Dr. Dean Ornish has conducted revolutionary research proving that simple diet and lifestyle changes can dramatically improve our health. So you have done studies on people who have reversed chronic heart disease. We found that even severe heart disease can be reversed. Type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high yeah. cholesterol. Dean Ornish has been married for 13 years now to Ann Ornish. Ann is the Vice President of Program Development at the Preventive Medicine Research Institute. Life is to be enjoyed. It's a nonprofit organization dedicated to preventing and reversing most chronic diseases. Now in their groundbreaking best-selling book, Undo It, the Ornishes introduce a new radical theory. The couple believe that by focusing on four components, you can reverse the progression of most common chronic diseases, slow down the aging process, and lead a happier, more fulfilled life. If we can connect the dots between what we do and how it makes us feel, then we can intentionally choose more of what we love with those we love. So here we are in my organic garden in Maui. No better place, I thought, to discuss Indeed. undoing it, <laughs> undoing it. It's beautiful here. How simple lifestyle changes can reverse most chronic diseases. You've been talking about this for a long time, and now you and your wife, Anne, are talking about it That's right. together. We'll be joined by Anne in a little bit. But I think the, the very idea that, that you can change and reverse Chronic diseases is what you're saying in Undo It. Yes. By changing your habits, changing the way you love, and changing the way you eat. Eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Boom, that's it. And the more diseases we study and the more underlying mechanisms we look at, the more evidence we have that these simple changes can make such a powerful difference in people's lives in ways we can actually measure. How did you know this to be true? Oh, well, I think our unique contribution has been to use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove how powerful these very simple lifestyle changes can be. And the lifestyle medicine, as you mentioned, is this field of using lifestyle changes not only to help prevent disease, which we all know, but actually to reverse it, mm -hmm. sometimes in combination with drugs and surgery and sometimes uh, different than that. And I got interested in that when I was, uh, um, well, I guess I out of my own sense of despair and depression when I was 19. Yes, uh, in college. In college, and was a freshman at uh, Rice University in Houston. And I came about as close to committing suicide as you can without actually doing it. Mm -hmm. And uh, Meaning um, you were going through suicidal ideation and you actually, had you actually planned how to do it? I had a plan, I was down to the uh, detail. But um, what saved me when, was that I got so run down. And, and what, the reason I got so depressed was I yeah, thought- Yeah, I was gonna ask what, what was causing that? Well, I, it was a, two things. One is I felt like I was a fraud. I was an imposter, that I had managed to get into a school with a bunch of really smart people. My college roommate at the time scored a perfect score on his SATs and so on. And now that I was in school with a bunch of really smart kids, it was just a matter of time before they figured out what a big mistake they'd made in letting me in. But more than that, I had this spiritual vision, which, you know, kind of a bona fide spiritual vision that nothing can bring lasting happiness. And the combination of feeling that nothing, that I was never gonna mount to anything, and even if I did, it wouldn't matter, it was like, well, why don't I just kill myself and be done with it? Dead people look like they're peaceful. Were, were you around like 19, 20 when this happened? I was happened? 19 at the time, yeah, exactly. Yeah, because this happens a lot with, I think, at that age. Well, actually, suicide is now the leading cause of death in, in kids that old, yeah. uh, more than anything. Yeah. So what saved me is that I, I was so run down, I stayed up for a week straight. I, I was so agitated, I couldn't even you know, sit down long enough to tell you. If, you. if you showed me a headline in a newspaper, I couldn't tell you a minute later what it said. And um, I got so run down that I got this horrible case of infectious mononucleosis that I literally couldn't get out of bed. My parents got wind that all was not well with their older son. They, they saw what a wreck I was and they took me home to Dallas and my plan, as crazy as that sounds, was to get strong enough to kill myself, mm -hmm. you know. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, my older sister, who had been a child of the 60s, uh, had been helped by a, an ecumenical spiritual teacher. And so there's an old saying that when the student is, the student is ready, the teacher appears. The teacher appears. comes, yeah. And that was certainly true for me. So in walks, so they, my parents decided to have a cocktail party for the Swami to thank him for helping my older sister. And he walks in and he starts to give a lecture, a satsang in our living room, and he starts off by saying, Nothing can bring lasting happiness, which I'd already figured out, except I was ready to do myself in and he was glowing. It's like, what am I missing here? And he went on to say what 
probably sounds like a new age cliche, but it, uh, it turned my life around, which is that nothing can bring you lasting happiness, but it's our nature to be happy and peaceful. You have it already. And that not being mindful of that, we end up running after all these things. If only I had more money, more power, more beauty, more sex, more accomplishment, more name, more fame, whatever. If only I had blank, then I'd be happy. Then people would love me. Then I wouldn't feel so bad. Then I could, wouldn't feel so lonely and depressed. And then I, everything would be fine. If only. If only. And what he taught me was that once you set up that view of the world, however it turns out, you, you lose because... Yeah. You will never be happy. And what the Swami said is that, in one of the ultimate ironies, is that we have that already. It's our nature to be happy and peaceful and loving. And not being aware of that, we run after those things. And in the process of running after them, we end up disturbing what we could have already if we just stopped doing that. And he said that when you quiet down your mind and body, you know, the ancient swamis and rabbis and priests and monks and nuns. All didn't... spiritual teachings of the world tell That's us right. this. Yes. The same thing that yeah. they don't bring you, when you meditate, it doesn't make you, it doesn't bring you peace. What it does is it helps you stop disturbing what's already there. Yeah. And that may sound like just a semantic That's why the, in the, the Bible it's be still That's right. and know. And, 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 and I know. am. Yeah. And know that I am. I said, okay, well, let me... Uh, move killing myself down to plan B, and I, I'll try this weird stuff, you know. Yeah. Maybe I'll <laughs> listen to this guy, yeah. And he said, if you, uh, you know, basically eat a plant-based diet, meditate, do yoga, exercise, love more, you know, you'll heal. So I thought, let me give that a try. I couldn't even, I was so agitated, I couldn't even sit still long enough to meditate, so I'd meditate while walking around. And then I began to get little glimpses of what that meant. And it turned my life around. And then I went back to school. I graduated first in my class. I gave the baccalaureate. I mean, I say that not to brag, but to say I experienced both ends of that spectrum. And while I totally felt totally worthless and stupid and the other, you know, highly successful, but it was because what changed was my intention behind it. And that was, I, I didn't need now to get, do well in school and get into medical school and be a doctor and, and so people so love me. It didn't shift, it, it didn't shift that night. That night you decided, I'm going to listen to what this guy is saying. Right. What was the period of time it took to shift? Uh, maybe over a couple, three months. And the desire to kill yourself, the ideation, the thoughts about that changed it, in that it, period of time? That's right, it did. And I've seen the darkest of the dark, you know, when uh, that, uh, you know, just the total despair. I mean, it's the worst feeling in the world. And being able to come out of that really transformed my life. And you've talked about this so many times. Yes, that... but you did that with no medication, not seeing a, sh a shrink. Well, not... no, I saw a shrink and they put me on these horrible um, psycho anti-psychotic drugs, you know, and then I got off of all that medication. And I knew that wasn't my life's destiny. I, I mean, there was this little voice that I, and the Swami taught me to listen to that little voice. And what he said is that the power of meditation is it quiets your mind and body down. So first of all, you begin to focus better. When you can focus energy, you gain more power. Yeah. Light, uh, laser is just focus light. You can yeah. burn through steel. You begin to, whatever you do in school and music and sports, uh, you, you, you do it better. But the more important thing is that you rediscover and I began to rediscover inner sources of peace and joy and well-being and realize that that's our natural state. Right. And more importantly than that even is I began to, so when I began to feel stressed or anxious, the question shifted from how can, how can I get what I need to be happy to what am I doing that's disturbing that I already have and how can I stop doing that? Ah. That's something I can do something about. It's recognizing that that sense of stillness, groundedness, the center, is always, always there. It's always there. Yes. We all have this inner Swami, this inner guru, the still small voice within, the God within, the guru within, whatever name you give to that. Yes. Even to give it a name is to limit what's essentially yeah. a, an ineffable limitless Because that experience. thing is connected to every other thing that's in every Everyone other and everything, yes. exactly. Mm -hmm. And it's the voice that wakes me up at three in the morning and says, hey, Dean, listen up, pay attention. You're not yeah. doing something that's in your best interest. And I've learned to trust that voice. Well, everybody has the voice. Everyone has that voice. And, so, and I think you are successful in direct proportion to how you listen to the voice or don't. Exactly. And yes. so what, the vo what, what he taught me to do is to say, at the end of a meditation, when, the, when you can access that voice more, because it's the one that sp speaks very clearly, but very quietly, it gets drowned out by the chatter. And by meditation, life. you mean getting still enough to- To hear it. To hear it. That's right. Yeah. Because I think people get really intimidated by this idea of meditation. Oh, I understand. Even though more and more people are talking about it and they think, well, I tried to do that. I did that for 10 minutes and nothing happened. That's right. You know? <laughs> it's like, that's what somebody said to me once. <laughs> I did that for 10 minutes and nothing happened. Yeah. <laughs> well, what I've learned to do is at the end of a meditation to ask that, to say hello to that voice and it'll say hello back. And I'll say, what am I not paying attention to that I need to pay attention to? And just listen. And it's amazing. And it's also, uh, I would just like to say to, to folks who are hearing this, um, th that 
it, it's, it's sometimes it's not even a voice. It's like a feeling. An awareness. An awareness, That's yes. Right. Yeah. yeah. And I've learned to trust that voice. Everything I've done since then, people thought was impossible at the time. And I've learned to trust that little voice and, and to kind of reverse engineer, like, this is going to work. You know, you can reverse heart disease. You can reverse diabetes. You can reverse all these different chronic conditions, which we later showed. But the awareness came first and then the kind of like, okay, how can I design a study to see if that's true? And so you were able to do that. You were saying, Dr. Dean Ornish, that you were able to achieve those uh, seemingly unachievable uh, goals by listening to that voice. That's right. Yeah. And, I, and I decided that, uh, like, what's the worst that could happen? I'll learn something. And there's nothing wrong with failure as long as I, I learn something. And I also re realized that by making that commitment uh, and kind of an inviolable commitment, that kind of the universe begins to respond. And you have things happen that are hard to explain, but are just, uh, you've talked about it many times, are very powerful. Coming up. You say on page 16, you write, like most physicians, I was trained to view heart disease, diabetes, prostate cancer, other chronic illnesses as being fundamentally different from each other, different diagnoses, different diseases, different treatments, but they're really not as different as they seem because they share many common origins and pathways. You know, I think a lot of people would struggle to understand this because you know, the doctor tells you to take a pill for this problem, then you take right. another pill for that problem. A lot of people are on lots of different medications. So how are diseases more alike than different? That's what I hear you saying and undo it. Exactly. And I was trained, like most doctors, to view heart disease and diabetes and prostate and breast cancer and all these different conditions as being fundamentally different. Different diseases, different diagnoses, and different treatments. But over the 40 years of doing this work, where we use these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures to prove the power of these very low-tech and low-cost and often ancient interventions, I realized that they're really the same disease masquerading and manifesting in different forms. That's the kind of the radical unifying theory of this book, that they're really the same condition. Because, you know, with all this interest in personalized medicine, we found it was the same lifestyle changes, eat well, move more, stress less, love more, in all of these studies we did over the last four decades could reverse all of these different conditions. It wasn't like there was one set of diet and lifestyle recommendations for reversing heart disease, a different one for prostate cancer and so on. It was the same for all of them. And it's why you often see many people have these, several of these conditions at the same time. They'll have heart disease and high blood pressure and be overweight and yeah. have diabetes and so on because it's really all the same. Or whole countries like in China, 50 or 60 years ago, they had almost none of these chronic diseases, and then they started to eat like us and live like us and die like us, you know, even though they have the same genetic diversity. So we found first that these saving lifestyle changes could reverse heart disease, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol. When people get put on medications... That's that, why, no matter what's bothering you, if you go to your doctor, they tell you to exercise more. That's right, because it's not like you have to do one kind of exercise that's for That's right, and other, exercise yeah. just really is a panacea for so many things. And so is meditation, and so is a plant-based diet, and so is loving more. They're for all of these. We found that these same lifestyle changes could reverse aging at a cellular level. We did a study with Dr. Elizabeth Blackburn, who got the Nobel Prize for discovering telomeres, the ends of our chromosomes that control how long we live. And as you get older, your telomeres get shorter, and as your telomeres get shorter, your lives get shorter, and the risk of premature death from pretty much everything goes up correspondingly. We found for the first time, she did a study where she found with Alyssa Eppel that stress and improper diet and loneliness and depression could shorten your telomeres. She did a study with women who were chronic caregivers of, of kids with autism and parents with Alzheimer's and found the more stress they were, the shorter their telomeres were. And the difference between the low and high stress women was a nine to 17 year shortening of their lifespan. But it wasn't an objective measure of stress, it was the women's perception of it. You could have two women in very similar life situations. One was eating well, meditating and so on, they could buffer that. We found for the first time we could actually lengthen telomeres. And when we published this in The Lancet... The, so are telomeres a part <clears throat> of your gene? They're, they're the ends of your chromosomes. They're like the plastic tip on the end of a shoelace that keeps your shoelace from unraveling. They keep your genes from unraveling, your DNA uh -huh. from unraveling. And we found that we could actually lengthen them. And when The Lancet editors sent out a press release when we published our study, they called it reversing aging at a cellular level. We published a study with Craig Venter, who discovered the uh, human genome. We found that we could 
uh, change over 500 genes in just three months. So often people say, oh, I've just got bad genes, what can I do? It turns right. out you can do a lot. Not to blame, but to empower. Again, if we're just a victim, I mean, when Bill Clinton's bypass is clogged up, his cardiologist held a press conference, said, oh, it was all in his genes, his lifestyle had nothing to do with it. And having worked with him for many decades, I knew it had everything to do with it and called him up and I said, look, uh, you know, it's not all in your genes. If it were, you'd be a victim. You're not a victim. You're one of those powerful guys on the planet. And so that's when he began following this program over 10 years ago, and he's doing well. And so when people learn that by changing your lifestyle in only three months, you can change over 500 genes, turning on the genes that keep us healthy, turning off the genes that cause us to get sick, that many people who have been told they have to take medications to lower their cholesterol or their blood pressure or their blood sugar, and they say, doctor, how long do I have to take these? What does the doctor usually say? Forever, right? It's like, yep. It's like mopping up the floor around a sink that's overflowing. Nobody's turning off the faucet. How long do I have to mop up the floor? Like forever. Like, well, why don't we treat the cause and not just to literally or figuratively bypass it? And but we now find... we live in a world where, I mean, I was just saying, people, you get a pill for everything. Yes. There's a pill. There's a pill, obviously. People, you know, my mother was an insulin taking, shooting diabetic and had to prick her finger every day. Yes. She had coronary heart disease. She had high blood pressure. You know, and there's a pill. Like, b before she died, there were there a like... A dozen pills. Yeah. At least. 21 different medications. See, that's what I mean. Yeah. And what we found is that, again, if people are listening to this, under your doctor's supervision, if you follow this program, most people can reduce or get off these medications at a fraction of the cost, and the only side effects are, are good ones. And it's very empowering to be able to get off these medications because they all have side effects. And we found that, you know, our bodies have a remarkable capacity to begin healing, and much more quickly than we had once realized because these underlying biological mechanisms are the same. That's why, you know, oxidative stress, chronic inflammation, changes in your telomeres, in your gene expression, in your microbiome, the 100 trillion organisms in your gut, and so on. They're all responsive to what we eat, how we respond to stress, how much exercise we get, and how much love and support we have. Mm -hmm. And how quick, that can happen within hours, not just weeks or years, but in hours, how you can get better quickly, you can get worse quickly, depending on what you do. Coming up. Let's bring in your wife, Anne, your co-writer on the book. Excellent idea. Anne, come in. My true love. Your true love. Anne, true love, come in. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so how did you all decide to do this together? Why, why was this a together project? Because we've worked together for over 20 years. Yeah. And uh, she is as brilliant as she is beautiful, and she is... Uh, it's just awesome in every way. But I read that when you all first met, it was a soul connection. Explain it's true. how. Yeah, I think that, you know, it was this immediate feeling of being seen, being heard, and understood. And it's there had been a lot of relationships that had great components to it, but I didn't feel completely met. And so, it was um, initially just through work and feeling like that perspective on life, we could share a dharma, a sense of service, and shared values. And I know you have extraordinary talent in training in yoga and meditation, and you were trained by the, in mindfulness by John Kabat-Zinn, who's the master. Long-time so, friend. Wonderful friend. So were you in her meditation class or something? How does this happen? <laughs> Why don't you explain? <laughs> no, we actually, when he had a contract with WebMD, he had a lifestyle channel on, on WebMD. In and 1999. Was, needing a web producer. I was working for someone he knew at the time. He called her firm and said, do you have someone who you think would be good for this job? And she made the recommendation, and uh, eight years later, we were married. Wow, wow. <laughs> As a matter of fact, you say in the introduction that this is a science-based, love-based program. <laughs> That's why it works so well. With it, we hope to entice and empower you to experience even greater happiness and pleasure, healing, and meaning. And you call, actually, the science in this book is based on a love offering. That's right. How important um, for our spiritual well-being, we know love is important for our spiritual well-being, but how does love actually contribute to our physical health? Really good question. Uh, this is a, our conspiracy of love is what we call it, you know, <laughs> um, because first of all, study after study have shown that people who are lonely and depressed, which I think is the real epidemic in our culture, mm -hmm are three to, t three to 10 times more likely to get sick and die prematurely yeah. when compared to those who have a sense of love and connection and community. And I think it's because Connection we are, is everything. Connection is everything, intimacy is everything. Mm -hmm. And you can only be intimate to the degree that you feel safe. And so when you're committed to someone, as we are totally committed, 
the heart opens more and more, you begin to experience more of a greater sense of intimacy. And the more intimate it is, the more pleasurable, the more erotic, the more joyful it becomes, and the more healing it becomes. You know, even the word healing, as you know, comes from the word to make whole. Yoga is from the Sanskrit, to yoke, to unite, union. These are really old ideas that we're rediscovering. Yeah. And it comes down to asking, you know, why do you want to live longer? It's not to be uh, taken for you know, for granted that we all want to live longer because of the suicide and depression rates as they are. It's really about self-love, about asking ourselves, why do I want to live longer? And it's a very personal question that only each of us can identify. Mm -hmm. And when we do, it can be this superpower that we can rep recruit to empower ourselves in the face of a temptation. If we can remember what is when I reflect on the, the people uh, and the moments that inspire me, my sense of purpose in this life, that inspire me to be alive, to thrive presently and in the future, those are acts of self-love, that I love myself well enough to fulfill my greatest purpose, my sense of my truest and fullest self, then it becomes so much bigger. And usually that en encompasses the people that we love. So if we can connect the dots between what we do and how it makes us feel, then we can intentionally choose more of what we love with those we love. And then it becomes self-fulfilling and a virtuous cycle. It's like the heart, uh, when sometimes when I lecture, I'll say, to which organ does your heart pump blood first? And people go, oh, your lungs or your brain. It's, it actually pumps blood to itself first so that it can then pump blood to the rest of the body. Is that selfish or unselfish? Well, it, it's both. It's know? the way we should be running our lives. Exactly. Yeah giving to yourself first so that you have more to give to others. Precisely. So let's go through the four. Eat well. Eat well. By eating well, you mean plant-based diet. And I, I think that's interesting. You don't say vegetarian or vegan. You say eat a more plant-based diet. What that's does right. that mean? Fruits, vegetables, whole grains, legumes, as, as they come in nature. You know, uh, it is basically a vegan diet, but vegan is one of those words that kind of pushes people's buttons, you know? Yeah. But, it's a plant-based diet. I think that's the easiest way to describe it. It's low in fat and low in sugar. Okay. And move more. Move more is, if you like it, you'll do it. Try, try to find an exercise that combination of aerobic and strength training and some stretching as I well. I think walking is just the best thing. And I've got all these hills and it mountain is. out there. I mean, it's just the best thing. Yeah, walking half an hour a day is all we ask to ask people to do. And that would actually make a change. That can reverse most chronic diseases in combination with these other things. Yeah. I often think that about my mother and other relatives. I mean, particularly in the African-American community, there's a whole group of people who just stop moving after a certain age. Yes. Yes. It's not just African-Americans, it's everyone. I talk in the book that sitting is the new smoking. You know, that there's, Interesting. there's simple things you can do. If you can incorporate it into your daily life, just get a portable phone, for example. Walk mm -hmm. around when you're talking on the phone. Uh, take the stairs a flight or two. I used to get frustrated when I couldn't find a parking space near the gym. I thought, this is ridiculous. So I just deliberately park farther away just so I can get a little of exercise and not feel so yeah. stressed out. So, and I know, uh, first of all, moving more is most important. And you talked so much about in the book and um, you write about questions you can ask yourself for mindful eating. What are some of those questions? I think just tuning in to say, you know, why do I eat? And so there's a, a reflex that so many of us have. <laughs> why feel. do I eat? <laughs> to, to check in how you're feeling. Am I really hungry or am I just stressed? Or am I tired? Maybe it's better to just get up and, and walk for 15 minutes. And maybe that's going to give me the feeling that I'm needing instead of reflexively grabbing the, the bag of chips. Uh, then it's, uh, where do I eat? So are you eating on the go, um, in front of the computer, while standing up in the kitchen? All of those things mm -hmm. um, have been shown to that we'll eat more, up to 40% more, but enjoy less. So that's just, you know, that's very unfortunate because food is to be enjoyed, which is about how we eat. So to the extent that we can be fully present with what we're eating, we're going to enhance how much pleasure we're getting out of it. So to recruit each of the senses. So we go into, if you, if, I'm sure you've experienced this, that it's the first bite where you can really taste it. And yeah. Just appreciate it. 
<laughs> and, but increasingly, and after that, after that, yeah, we go on right. autopilot. Yeah, and so a couple of tricks is to one, just to check in with how you're feeling. Am I really feeling hungry? There's a hunger fullness scale. So on one side, yeah. it's like I'm hangry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah whatever it's really feeling. <laughs> and on the other side, it's feeling totally stuffed and just so uncomfortable, and and you have to digest. So we're trying to check in so that we can eat when we're hungry. It sounds obvious, but by just checking and in and stop when you're full and stop when you're and to be Ooh. conscious enough, mindful enough to know when that is. So a little other trick is to put your fork down between mm. bites so that it's not about the, the next bite um, coming in, it's about enjoying the one that's in your mouth and all of the sensations, how you're smelling it, how it tastes on the, on the palate of your tongue, how it feels as it goes down and coats your inside of your body and yeah. nourishes you, really yeah. feeling the, the nourishment, not just the taste. Coming up, So it's eat well, move more, stress less, love more. Yes. It was, it's so easy to say stress less. I mean, I think most of the world lives in this sort of anxiety state, anxious state. It's true. That's why Xanax is so popular. Well, it's true. And actually, Xanax causes dementia, we're, we now know. But, um, you know, in doing these studies, I had the chance to spend no, time. No, I didn't know that. Does it, it? It does, actually. All of the benzodiazepine can cause dementia. Really? Yeah. Okay. So just so you know, <laughs> one of the things that in, in doing these studies, we got to spend a lot of time with the same group of people. And I, I learned that it wasn't enough to give people information. If it were, nobody would smoke. It's not like I'd say, hey, Oprah, did you know smoking's bad for you? Go, oh, I didn't know that. I'll quit today. It's like everybody knows these things. Just, we live in an era where... But everybody doesn't know Xanax can cause dementia. That's true. That's yeah. true. <laughs> That's true. <laughs> have there been studies or that show that? Yes, they, there have been. And they're, they're, uh, they're scary. Uh, again, if you can meditate instead of taking Xanax, it's better for you than we even realized. Wow. But the thing is, is that when I I'd ask people, I say, why do you smoke or overeat or drink too much or work too hard or abuse opioids or, you know, video games or whatever, these behaviors seem so maladaptive to me. And they look at me, they go, they're not maladaptive, they're very adaptive. They help us deal with our loneliness, our stress. Mm -hmm. You know, they'll say things like, I've got 20 friends in this pack of cigarettes and they're always there for me and nobody else is. You know? Yeah, I've heard people you say You know, that. or I've got, uh, or food fills that void or fat coats my nerves and numbs the pain or video games numb the pain or alcohol or opioids or other drugs numb the pain or working all the time. So we've learned that instead of just focusing on the information or the behavior to say, what's really going on here? And when we work at that level, we find that people are much more likely to make and maintain lifestyle choices that are life enhancing than ones that are self-destructive. So you have done studies on people who have actually, I know over the years, who have reversed chronic heart disease. We've found that even severe heart disease can be reversed type 2 diabetes, high blood pressure, high yeah. cholesterol. We did the first randomized trial showing with uh, Dr. Peter Carroll, who's the chair of urology at UCSF, and the late Bill Fair when he was the chair at Sloan Kettering, that even early stage prostate cancer may be slowed, stopped, and even reversed. If it's true for prostate cancer, there's a good chance it'll be true for breast cancer. We can reverse aging and change gene expression. And we're now doing the first randomized trial to see whether these same lifestyle changes may be able to reverse the progression of early stage Alzheimer's disease. My mom died of Alzheimer's, it runs in our family. So I have, a, and there are no good drugs either for treating it or for preventing it. And I think we're at a place with Alzheimer's very much like we were with heart disease 40 years ago, that it's the same mechanisms that cause it. Less intensive interventions may slow the rate of progression. We think, we hope to show, we don't know of course yet, but we hope to show that we may, that a more intensive intervention may actually reverse it. But I also want to talk a little bit about what you said about how people are so st stressed out these days. And I think that so much suffering comes by seeing people as being separate and only separate. Yeah. And so much suffering, you know, where you see people as different and only different, the other. Right. Once you define people as the other, then you can do bad things to them. You know, those Mexican rapists, those Muslim terrorists, those whatever, those whatever. Whatever label you've given to the other. The other. And, and I think that anything that brings us together is really healing. And that the perennial philosophy that you find in all spiritual paths of love and compassion and forgiveness and altruism really come from that direct experience that 
on one level, we are separate. You know, you're you and I, me, and we can enjoy having this conversation. But on another level, we're part of something larger that connects us. Whatever name you give to that, even to give it a name, as we talked about, is to limit what's essentially an ineffable, limitless experience. And that, to me, is part of the value of meditation, is if it not only does it help you manage stress, it makes your fuse longer, you can accomplish more with less stress, it can help you access your own inner voice, as we talked about. But if you take it even deeper, it gives you that direct experience of transcendence. The cool thing about it, too, is that it's what got me interested in it. Obviously, yoga was uh, my doorway into the, this lifestyle. And, you know, as a parent, um, my practice is one of equanimity so that I don't get t triggered by, especially, you know, having a, a teenager. It's constantly this dance that we're doing with them and so that we can respond in the most loving ways instead of getting triggered and going down to their level because they're trying to trigger us. That's what they're trying to figure out what their boundaries are. And it's the same with, you know, when we're at work, we can't necessarily change. Yeah, that's a natural part of what being a, a teenager is. Absolutely. Yes. So we were, that's a, something we remind ourselves of several times a day. <laughs> <laughs> if, we don't, if we forget, the universe reminds us. Yeah. So you can't always uh, change the stressors in our life, the, the, the job that we have, the relationships, the commute. But what we can do with just a little bit of relaxing and relieving stress for little moments in our day by just doing uh, a little, a one minute breathing meditation, just to kind of get back to the, drop that anchor inside ourselves. Then we have this buffer. So I call it the sacred pause. So noticing a trigger coming in real time and then having a, I usually start my day with um, a affirmation that's there to, to re-invoke my intention for the day. And with the breathing, I can drop that anchor so that I'm choosing how do I want to proceed in this moment instead of just feeling I'm um, reacting to everything around me, which feels very disempowering. Things are happening on the outside to me. It's that I keep that anchor inside so that I am at the helm and my heart is really at the helm so that I can make compassionate and intentional choices as best I can, right? It's yeah. a practice. I think, yeah, we're all doing that in our own way. I try to do that in like every time you see that ego show up, yeah. every time that shows up, you are able to quiet that, you know, and the recognition that that is your ego yes. actually quiets that ego. That's right. Yeah. That yeah, and allows you to move from a space of greater consciousness and, exactly. and, and awareness. Which is an awareness practice. It really yes. is. Awareness is the first step to it all. It's true. And, and I want to build on what you said earlier about meaning, because when I was at, in, at 19, I could take all the meaning out of everything. Who cares? Why bother? Nothing matters. So what? You know, that total nihilism. But later I realized that we can add meaning to our lives. And one way to do that is by choosing not to do certain things. What I do know is that just the act of choosing not to eat something imbues that with meaning or being in a committed monogamous relationship, just the act of saying, I'm just gonna have sex with one person, and is that the ball and chain? Well, it can be, but it can also be, you know, you can only be intimate to the degree that you can, you feel safe, and you can only do that to the degree you feel, uh, if you're totally committed with someone, then you say, okay, I'm... I think people confuse intimacy with lust and passion. That's right. Which is a completely different thing. But all the way... But... And so what's lacking in so many people's lives even though they're having sex, there is a lack of true intimacy. That's right. And the more intimate it becomes, the, 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 the secret that we learn is the more erotic it becomes. It's like uh, there was a hundred years ago, an, an Indian saint said, you can dig a lot of shallow wells and never reach water. You can dig one deep one and reach the wellspring. And so the, the, it's like there are layers of an onion that our hearts, you know, even after being lovers now for how many, however many years it's been, 15, 16 years, um, we still find that we can trust more. Trust is everything. You can only yeah. trust to the degree that you feel safe. You can only do that degree there's a commitment. And so the paradox is that the commitment, rather than being confining, actually is liberating. Mm -hmm. Because instead of having the same kind of erotic experience with different people, we have these intensely variable, maybe you should talk about this. So I was also I gonna say with the intimacy into. that when we, first of all, it's so nice to have 15 years of being in relationship with one another because we recognize those triggers and those patterns and we're like oh here comes that one again and we can say i don't want to go through that that used to take us an hour to process through that or a we're week. like yeah. now we're like that's this one we know this tape really well yes and we ground ourselves back in are we fully committed well that's because you're in a real spiritual partnership with gary zukov calls a 
between equals for the purpose of spiritual growth. It's absolutely true. Yeah, when you're actually in relationship and you know that the reason why we're here is for- To be mirrors for each other. To be mirrors for each other. Exactly. And you're gonna grow and I'm gonna grow and I wish you well in that and you wish me well in that. that that's how, that's the only way. And the, and the Our other, question we, that we ask each other is that, are we fully committed? Sometimes, you know, you, you just are in a reaction or red zone as I call it. And it's like, I'm out of here, I'm gonna go. <laughs> go yeah. on a vacation or whatever, <laughs> yeah. just leave the house for until I simmer down here. But just asking that question, are we fully committed? Yes. It just grounds say... us right back into the heart space. So then we're like, let's just fast forward, sort of bend time and space and go to the end of this fight that we've known, we know really well. In other words, if we know that we're eventually gonna to get to a good place, why don't we just go to that place? And you know, Ann's father died a few weeks ago. Seeing how he struggled, you know, he had pancreatic cancer for four and a half years, just to have a few more days. And we thought, well, God, what if we just knew we only had a few more days? Would we be having this argument, you know? Is there a way that we can just like, okay, if we know we're gonna get to a good place eventually, why don't we just go there right now? You know, and, yeah, then, he, and then we could be having so much can more Can you all do like that? Like if you're in the middle of an argument or a conversation? We, we have stage, a code word that we this use. This stage you don't have And to we could never remember the code word, so we finally said, why don't we just use code word as our code word? So <laughs> <laughs> that remind, reminds us that. But it is, I feel like, uh, my dad's passing and really having those four bonus years with pancreatic cancer, seeing and witnessing life with somebody who doesn't know if this is their last day. At any moment, it could end. So he did not waste a minute with anything petty. It was such a healing time for our family. He had been um, remarried. My mom had passed 12 years earlier. And there was, you know, some difficulty in, in welcoming our uh, my new, my stepmom, but she ended up is now one of my very best friends, and that it just fast forwards to what is our intention? Where do we want to end up with this? And mm -hmm. we want to be in a loving place. We just can fast forward going there because every moment is so precious. Coming up. You've been at the bedside of a lot of patients yes. who didn't make it. What does watching people die teach you about mm -hmm. life? Well, I came so close to death when I almost killed myself. It's not an overstatement to say that I came about as close to doing that as you can without doing it. A death is, uh, is a real presence for me and uh, a clarifying presence because it, it, it ultimately can rob someone of all their meaning or it can bring someone all their meaning. And so being with people who are dying in that transition space, they almost get translucent in a way. They're, a lot of, they're neither while well, they're in, in that transition. But okay, can I just stop you a second? Because people who are hearing us right now or watching us right now, there's no doubt that somebody who is listening wherever they are in the world is thinking about killing themselves. Well, in this happens, moment. Okay, so let me tell you. It's let me killing, that killing themselves in the moment. And can you imagine at 19, look at what you would have missed. It's like that, you know, great movie, It's a Wonderful Life. You yeah. Know, um, what, what your life would have been, yeah. had, you know. And I think about that a lot. And I think that if there is a hell, it would have been seeing what my life could have been. Yeah. And not being able to do it. It makes me want to cry, really, thinking about it. And not meeting Anne and not having our, our, our kids and so on. It's, uh, I'm having my cry with Oprah moment here. <laughs> Go ahead. No, but can you imagine? Yes, when you oh, look at that, look at what, since 19, everything you've accomplished, everything you've offered to the world, the number of books, the science, the love offerings that you have been able to give, none of that would have happened. None of that would you have happened. You changed the way medicine saw itself. Thank you. None of that would have happened. Well, it's true. And I, I also take solace in the fact of knowing that, or, or people should know if they're thinking of killing themselves, that it looks like, what I was thinking when I was 19, like dead people look like they're pretty peaceful. I want to be peaceful. I mean, I want to be like them. But I learned through spiritual practice and having direct experiences that the physical body is just one body, that we have a layers of bodies, you know, including an astral body, that when you kill yourself, your body dies, but your soul lives on. And it lives on in a way that's not so different than you, what it is, except you just don't have a body anymore. And you, then you see what your life could have been, and you, you know, you don't really have that sense of peace. You that can't, the death doesn't give you peace. The only way is through, you know. Yeah. And that we have created this world for that reason is to teach us that and to have those experiences. So back to the question of what you, what the revelation has come from watching people at, on, their, on their deathbeds. People always want to say, "How is what kind of life did I lead? What what did I learn? What do I regret? What what could I have done better?" I think you know. Unfortunately, so often when people die in a 
intensive care unit on our ventilator, you know, with tubes in, you know, they don't really, they, they miss that moment. And as doctors, we're not trained to sit and be with people. We often view death as, as a failure, as opposed to a natural transition in life. Mm -hmm. And so part of why I love doing this work is that instead of a 10 minute office visit or a short visit, you know, making rounds in a hospital, we, we get to spend 72 hours with people. And so we really get to show them to rediscover their sense of meaning or inner sources of peace and joy and well-being, how to risk opening their hearts and loving themselves and loving other people. And at their deathbeds, it's very clarifying. It comes down to sometimes the people that are the most unhappy when they die are the most famous and successful because they've come to the end of that myth. It's not like they could say, gosh, if I just, if someone has a billion dollars, they could say, if I just had some more money, I'd be happy. Or if they're known, you know, all over the world, if I was just a little more famous, then I'd be happy. And when you come to the end of that path, when you're dying, for many people, it can be very traumatic, but in others, it can be incredibly liberating because it shows what really matters and what doesn't. And sometimes when people who thought they were gonna die don't and come back, it transforms their lives and they begin to do things that they never would have dreamed of doing otherwise. So the ultimate reason, or one of the ultimate reasons that you did undo it, is that you want people to have the most vital, vibrant, best life possible exactly. while, while you're here. Right? Exactly. It's all about living your best life, your most joyful, pleasurable, peaceful, transformative life. And it's easy. You know, are you saying no matter how sick you are, because there are a lot of people listening, hearing, watching us, and you've been given a diagnosis and you're thinking that's it, that's the end. Nothing works all the time for everyone, and, and, and death, death is 100%. But for the most common chronic diseases that we spent, you know, 86% of the $3.6 trillion we spent on healthcare last year are for the most common chronic diseases, heart disease, diabetes, mm -hmm. prostate, breast cancer, uh, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, uh, and probably a lot of the autoimmune diseases, and we hope Alzheimer's. We have a lot more control than we think. Again, not to blame, but to empower. And what we've been able to show is using these very high-tech, expensive, state-of-the-art scientific measures, how dynamic these underlying biological mechanisms are, how quickly they can respond when you make these changes and how much better you can feel. Thank you. Undoing it, thank you both. Thanks for joining me in the Great garden. To see you. Thank, thank you, you for being part of this conspiracy. Thank of love. you, thank you. <laughs>